Well, how about if we get started? All right. And what I like to do on this, fellas, is uh, has anybody here tied a fly on a tube? So a lot of this is what the heck is a tube? And why would you ever want to tie a fly on a tube when the hook seems to be just fine and it does a good job and so forth? Well, the, the last part of that story is just not true. And the reason for that is that for years we would tie steelhead and salmon flies on hooks that looked like this. This is about an 8 odd hook. And I mean, you know, the gape is pretty big, but look how long that hook shank is. And essentially when we started, well, when we, 250 years ago when they were tying salmon flies, these were blind eye hooks in that there was no eye in the end of it. And instead of there being an eye, it just came to a point. And then you would tie a piece of gut on there, and that became the eye. And if it was a fishing fly, you would tie the gut on back here and loop it around and so forth. If it's a, hey Jack, if it's a demonstration fly, you don't need to tie them back so far. But in any case, long shank hooks. And this is what we had for a long, long time. Uh, and, and, and what's interesting about this is this fly, if it's fully dressed, it doesn't move very well in the water. The, the materials you have on it might move, but look how long this is. That's not going to look much like a natural anything. So as things began to evolve, uh, salmon, a, a lot about steelhead flies evolved from uh, what we learned about salmon. And so what, what evolved then was people started tying salmon flies on metal and plastic tubes. And these metal and plastic tubes were of two different diameters. And they would take one length, very flexible, and tie a fly on that long length of flexible tubing. Then they'd have a shorter piece of tubing that they'd slide on the back, and that's where they would insert the hook. And the hook would go in with the eye. And typically the eyes were flat, and this would go in the back of the tubing, and that's how then the fly was here. You had a hook sticking out. Well, things continued to evolve to the point that uh, instead of those two different diameter tubes, uh, things continued to evolve to where all of a sudden people that manufactured fly tying tubes decided to put a, two different diameters in one tube. And you can see on here, this is called a 40 40, and that means there's 40 centimeters on one diameter and 40 centimeters on the other, but the entire tube is one piece. So in, this was a big advancement. So instead of having two separate tubes that we'd slide together, hey Kim, instead of two separate tubes we'd slide together, it was all on one, and it was really convenient. This was the greatest thing that ever happened when we started doing these things. Well, this evolved pretty well, but then the next step of it was we would, instead of having a long tube like this, all of a sudden we have a shorter tube, but instead of 40 centimeters, it's closer to 50, there's more space to tie the fly. And then what you would do on this one is insert another little tube in the back, put the hook in, and that's how you would fish. These things have gotten smaller and smaller to where you can actually tie any pattern down to about a size 10, you might get away with a 12 depending on the pattern. Anything below that is going to be too small to have any effect of a tube. Well, why did we start using tubes? Uh, was it just convenience? Uh, more sp uh, the, the space we had to tie the fly on, or why did we start doing this? Well, one thing that they, they discovered way back when was because this is a long shank, when this hook inserts in the mouth of a fish, you've got this much shank that now is going to serve with leverage. And what they discovered was because this was so long and because these steelhead and salmon jump a lot and pull and run and take off, they would throw their heads around 
and because so much leverage, it was very simple to throw the hook. If you ask a steelheader, how's your year, they won't tell you, well, the sand bass are running. and that type. They'll give you a percentage. They'll say, so far this year, I'm, I'm five for 11. And what that means is, while they've been fishing for steelhead and or salmon, they've had 11 hookups, and of that, they got five to hand. Some of them. Well, everybody got really concerned about the fact that this hook shank was so long that it was creating too much leverage once it was in the fish's lip, and it was simple for the fish to start throwing this fly out of its mouth. Well, what if we had a fly, a hook, this size? Look at the difference in the length of the hook shank. The red one has a very short shank, but yet you can buy these kinds of hooks with the same kind of gape sizes you can get on this. So if you wanted a 2 aught long shank hook, you can now get a 2 aught short shank hook. And the beauty of it is that now when the fish takes this fly and that hook inserts into their lip, look how much shank is sticking out, very little. And so what we noticed immediately was that it, without, instead of this long shank and having, let's say, a five for 11 year so far, once we went to these short shanks, you'd ask a steelheader, how's your year? And they would say, I'm nine for 11. I'm eight for 11. All of a sudden, we started seeing the percentages of hookups to hand increase significantly. And that's worth it. If you get more fish to hand, that's, that's worth doing this. What we also discovered that was really kind of a cool deal is you can dress a fly on a tube and this red hook sticking out is exactly the same hook as this one. But look how much longer this fly is. And what happens now is when a fish takes a fly on a tube, the tug that, is, that occurs here actually pulls this fly off of the tube. So that when you get this fish to hand, all you have in the lip is that little bitty shank. Your fly is up the leader. You don't have all of this leverage to deal with anymore. You just have a much smaller shank of hook. But they take the hook, the fly pops off, the knot right here and slides up the leader. You get the fish to hand. All you have to contend with is this little stinger hook. Now that's the biggest advantage to using a tube fly, but there's many other advantages. What if we're fishing along and we have this particular fly on this particular hook? And let's say this is a size two. And now we want to use a size four very simple. Cut this off, tie another loop, insert it in the eye. Now we've got a different size hook on the same fly. Simply pull the leader back forward, insert the knot into the back of the tube. Now we're ready to fish with a brand new hook. What happens if we're fishing and the hook we're using gets stuck in something and the tip breaks off, it gets dull, whatever? and we, we don't want to use that hook anymore. Very simple. Just cut this hook off, replace it with the hook you want, and keep fishing with a fly that may be producing very, very well. So when you break a hook or you dull this hook, you can file it while you're standing there in the river. But if it's really bad, this fly is of no use any longer. So now you have to go to your box and pick out a different fly. With the tube system, you just change a hook. 
and you can use the same fly as long as you want to use the same fly. So it's a pretty convenient method. The other thing that's nice about this is because this hook shank is so rigid, so long and so rigid, as this is moving in the water, it doesn't have much movement except for the material that's tied onto it. With this kind of a system, this thing's moving all over the place. Even within the hook itself, it's moving. So it's going to look more like a natural in the current as it's, the current's moving it down the river. So that's why we use tubes. Uh, the tubes have been around for a long, long time. Uh, matter of fact, uh, tubes uh, really became popular around the 1950s. And what's interesting is in Europe and the United States about the same time, people started using tubes, and the first tubes they used were hollow turkey quills. They didn't have metal, they hadn't thought of plastic yet, I guess, but they used hollow turkey quills, and they would tie a fly on a turkey quill and use that to fish, and they would tie on a gut eye and so forth, and, and they were all set. As things evolved, uh, we had metal tubes, we had those two tubes that were of different diameters. We had they got to a point of tubes that were 40-40. And then we got to a point where we have different lengths that we're going to tie the fly on. Hey, Jan. Hello. And then once we have tied the fly, <laughs> this little thing right here is very, very flexible, as you can see. This goes on the back. And that's all I have to fish. That's all I need. So these things have evolved. They started out in, in Europe and the United States around 1950. But in 1980, uh, the United States really jumped ahead in innovation and in, uh, tying these flies. And they became a very popular use, uh, especially in the Pacific Northwest in the steelhead and salmon culture. <coughs> so how do we go about doing this? Well. A fly is tied on something called a mandrel. It's a piece of metal. As you can see, it's got a flat section here and a round section down here. Changes diameter just a little bit. I insert this into my vise. I tighten it down just like I would a hook. And just like a hook, I'm looking at this mandrel to make sure that it's level. One thing that seems to be overlooked a lot among fly tires is they forget how important it is to put a hook in the vise and make sure that not only is the hook secure in the vise, but the hook shank is level. And then they wonder when they finish the fly, why are my proportions so out of whack? Well, it's because your hook shank was at an angle and it distorts everything. So you put this in your vise, tighten it down just like you would a hook, and the, the flies actually will be tied on here. We're going to slip for this for tonight. Let's use uh, let's use a 4040. We just slide that over, press it down. I want it to be in there strong enough so that as I'm tying thread around this this plastic, it's not going to turn. I don't want this plastic to turn while it's on the mandrel. So I insert this in the vise, tighten it down right there, just like a hook, I'm ready to tie. My option to this would be to take a length this long, insert the junction tube in the back, slide it on the mandrel, tie my fly on this portion right here. The fly we're going to tie tonight is one of these. This is an intruder fly, and it doesn't fit. I can tell you, it doesn't fit. You can try to tie an intruder. It gets really, really, really small on that size fly. So a little bit about this particular, how do you rig these things? Well, you see a piece of monofilament sticking out of here. So how, how do you do this? Well, once I have finished the fly, I'll take about a two-foot length of monofilament level. It's not tapered. And I'll insert one end of the monofilament into the head of the tube, slide it through, pull it out the back. 
once I get it out the back, I've got a couple options right here now. One is I can just tie any kind of a loop, like a double or a triple surgeon's uh, perfection loop, a Duncan loop, any kind of a loop knot can work. It's to your advantage to tie a loop that will have a big knot right here. I want a big knot right there because that is what's going to insert in the back end of the tube. If I have a very small knot, it'll insert into the tube but doesn't stay there very well. So I want to select a loop knot here that's going to have a big enough knot here to insert into this tube. Uh, very common uh, loop knot is a double or triple surgeons. Uh, a lot of guys like to go to a triple surgeons just because it gets a little bit fatter knot. That's the only reason. Maybe just a little bit stronger, but uh, because you get a bigger loop. What a lot of people use is something called a turl knot. Uh, which is very common among steelhead and salmon fishermen. And uh, another thing we do that I can explain later is we'll tie a turl knot, and then before we cast the fly, we actually tie something called a riffle hitch. A riffle hitch, very peculiar to the trout world, very peculiar to the bass world. Essentially what happens here is Once I've tied it, rigged up everything, then I tie another half hitch up here at the head, on the, on the head of the fly, typically on the side that I'm on. So in other words, if I cast this fly out into the current, the current's coming this direction. It'll sit just like that for a while. The current will hold it just like that. If I have a ritual, riffle hitch, which is a half hitch on this side of the fly, as this fly, the current is moving this fly, we, our strategy to fish for steelhead and salmon is very different than we are accustomed to with trout and bass. And I'll get into detail on that during the presentation. But essentially what happens is the current moves this fly and it gets to a point where the line is taut. And as the current continues to swing this fly into the bank, the fly turns. If I have that riffle hitch on this side, it straightens out the fly. So as it's coming into the bank, it comes in broadside instead of coming in this way. Why is that important? It's more natural. Actually, the most natural way would be for the current to move a bug uh, without any encumbrances at all, and it would just come straight ahead. Fish can see it. They can see them. Uh, what do we know about predators? Predators, any species, not just fish. Predators like to take their prey at the eyes. So what we attempt to do on steelhead and salmon fishing is we swing a fly to the bank. It comes to the bank coming at us this way. The riffle hitch turns it because of the current. The line is taut. The fly is like that. The fish come and take it at the eyes. Now, I'm going to get into more detail and strategy later on, but one of the things we get so accustomed to in fishing for trout is we th think of a trout stream where you've got some faster current and some slower current, so we all know about a seam. We know about the foam line. And typically what a trout will do is they'll sit in that seam where the slow water and the fast water meet, and that's where they can hold and watch for that piece of food coming down the current and not be stressed because of the stronger current. They're out of the stronger current. Then they're watching the current coming at them. They see a bug come. They move in. They take it. They move back out. We know that's what trout do. Forget that completely if you're going to be involved with steelhead and salmon. Steelhead and salmon sit out there in the ditch. When you throw this fly out there, they're watching it swing to the bank. They are absolutely not hungry. They've been sitting out in the ocean for weeks, and they've been gorging themselves on 
big protein. Can anybody tell me what is this? Oh, gosh. Okay, there we go. Right there. Okay, no matter what. Excuse me. Okay, so what is this? It's a squid. This is what steelhead and salmon have been eating for What's two or three. What's the actual size of that bunch about? Uh, they, they can go from uh, six to nine, ten, uh, and there's there's variations of the body types of squid, but they're substantial. And this is what steelhead and salmon have been eating for two or three years. Now they come back into the freshwater. And you think that little mayfly aquatic insect is going to make any difference? Zero. Have no, they're not hungry to start with, but they see that bug and it means absolutely nothing to them. So if we throw something like this out there, well, by golly, that looks an awful lot like that stuff I've been eating out there. This thing has a lot of movement. And as it's coming into the bank, you have to cast it a few times and... Occasionally, you could have an experience where you cast the fly out to the ditch and the steelhead take it out there. But 90% of the time, this little, uh, they get annoyed. They get bothered that something is in their space. They're not following this because they're hungry. They're predators. And they're going to attack this thing because it's bothering them. So this thing hits the water. It begins to come into the bank like this. Steelhead and salmon follow it. They don't sit in the, water, in the water column like trout do and move in and take food like we're accustomed to. They'll follow this thing to the bank. Thank you. And as, remember, the current's going to have this down in the water column, so as the line becomes tight in the last 20, 30 feet of the swing, the fly rises. The predator is thinking the prey is getting away. Most of the strikes you'll get in steelhead and salmon are in those last 20 or 30 feet because this fly rises when that line comes taut. It's tilted like this, and when they come and take it, now remember they're following it, it's not coming to them. And when they take this fly, they're on their way someplace. It's not like a trout, goes in, takes it, moves out, goes in, takes it, comes out. They are pissed. And so when they eat this thing, they are on their way someplace. Typically, it's to the downstream, to the tail out of wherever you're fishing. And you'll see with these rods we have over here, when you get into that 20, 30-foot range, you're in the zone, and a steel set head or salmon hammers that fly, you better. I've seen people have their rods pulled out of their hands. The tug is so incredible. But they not only take it, but as soon as they take it, Immediately, my, my, my ringtone on my phone used to be from a manufacturer of steelhead reels. And when I would get a call, it would go, <laughs> it would make that kind of noise. And the reason for it, that's the sound when that line, when the steelhead's taking your fly and they're going. And they get all the way into your backing and they snap you off at the reel. There's a big pop at the end of it. Yes, sir. For those of us that aren't familiar with that fish on that kind of fish, why does it take off immediately? What's the, what's the theory? Actually, there's several. Uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is that these are predators, and they're not, they're not hungry. They've just, it, some people will refer to it as the alligator grab. What does an alligator do? They come up and take something, they roll over and go back to the bottom. They just don't take their prey and be satisfied with that. They take it and then take their prey someplace. That's what big anadromous fish do. They come and take their prey, and then they go. As soon as they get that fly, they feel the resistance of the hook in their mouth, and they, they do everything they can to, to move against the resistance. They can tell instantly where that resistance is coming from. They go the opposite direction, and they will go as far and as fast as they possibly can. And they're jumping. They're going absolutely crazy. 
trying to get away from. They've got their prey. That's one theory. But the other part is they're getting away from the resistance they feel in the tight line, and they'll keep going. Pardon me? Aren't you fishing during the salmon run? Well, technically, yes, Peter, because they're, they're always moving. Yeah, I mean, they're going somewhere. They're always... To, to breed. They're not resident fish. They're migratory fish. And when they come from the salt water back to the fresh water, they're coming back for one purpose, not to eat. Yeah. To spawn, period. Yeah. To spawn, period. Yeah, I, to spawn. I caught some last year in downtown Gunnison. They were migrating up the, the Gunnison River mm -hmm. and from out of a big reservoir. And when you've got one of those on your hook, oh, you're a rod, boy, you just have to hang it. Yeah, it, it's, you'll hear people refer to, in any species, but you hear people refer to the tug as the drug. Let me tell you what, until you hung on to a steelhead that just took your fly, uh, you don't know what that means. It, it's uh, nothing, I know nothing else that compares to it. And I'll explain some of that later on, but uh, the, the tug truly is the drug. But they're migratory fish, they're not resident fish, they're not hungry, but they're predators. And they something comes in their area and they get upset and they take it as predators. And they try to take it somewhere. Yes, sir, Richard? So are these saltwater or freshwater? Are they going to be either? Well, I'm going to explain that at 7. But they're, these fish are actually born in the river as rainbow trout. They're rainbow trout fry. And I'm going to explain what happens to them, but... After about a year and a half, all those little babies that have been in that fishery or in that, that piece of water from where they are and decide, I'm going to the ocean. And I'll explain the reasons why. In hundreds, hundreds of miles, and typically they're at least four inches long at that point when they take off, and they'll leave the fresh water and they'll migrate to the salt and they'll live in the salt for two or three years. And they eat that big squid, and they get enormous. And when you, get, when you hold one, you, they're, they're magnificent color, which you'll, I've got videos that you'll see tonight, but they're the, it's like holding a big muscle. They are so incredibly strong. But you realize this fish has literally swam hundreds of miles from where it was born out to the salt, swim around out there for two or three years, and then come back to the exact spot where they were born to spawn. Think about what they've had to deal with. Predators, distance, dams, fish ladders, on and on and on. And so when you find a steelhead, they are a survivor. They've been through an incredible experience already. So let's, let's get into a... Uh, the steelhead fly, and this is going to be the intruder on a tube. And uh, as you can see, we've got the difference diameter occurs right there. So we're going to begin our, our jam hitch. It's not a knot, it's a hitch right there. Now, let me show you one thing when you're tying on a, a jam hitch. This tag end right here, and this in my left hand, is useful. I'll lay it across the top of the hook shank, or the tube in this case, and I'll start wrapping. But look, if I raise this up, the tag end up, and it creates that angle, like a 45 degree angle to the tube. When I bring my thread over the top, I can actually put it anywhere on that tag end, and it slides right down into position. So the tag end can be your friend when you're doing your jam hitch. What's your thread weight? Pardon me? Thread weight. This is Vivas thread. And uh, interesting story here, Richard. Uh, like most people, I started tying with uh, the three aught, and before the dinner system came in, the three aught, six aught, eight aught. And uh, when I started st in the 80s, when I started tying fully dressed salmon flies. I got really deep into the 12 aught thread. And the main reason is that uh, the biggest bugaboo about tying a, a salmon fly is you don't want any bulk, any place, head to tail, no bulk. 
the, the, the feature of the fly is the elements. There's no additional ball. Every wrap has a purpose and a meaning. And on a salmon fly, you don't have a single wrap that doesn't accomplish something specific. So when you get in the habit of tying a lot of those, uh, you end up tying about everything with 12 odd. If I'm spinning deer hair, you'll see a fly, a couple flies tonight that I tie for steelhead that are uh, spun deer hair flies, 12 odd. Now, what you have to be careful of when you're spinning deer hair is if you pull too tight, and by the way, every securing wrap on on fly tying goes straight up. And the reason for that is if my when I take this thread over the top, it's going to form a loop on the top. You see it on top of my finger right there? There's a loop up there. There's a loop right up there on the top of my finger. If I pull down this way, it turns my finger that way. If I pull this way, it turns my finger that way. But if I bring my loop all the way around and come straight up, it pulls the top of this loop straight down. And it secures my material. Hey, Sue, Bob. It secures the material with the loop pulling straight down, not in an angle. Now, there are occasions where that can be to your advantage to pull at an angle, but typically uh, your securing wraps are straight up. But 12 watt is, this is Vivas, and the reason I use Vivas is that uh, you can you can go out there and look at every uh, thread test there has ever been on on strength of tying thread, and uh, no matter what the size, three aught, six aught, twelve aught, Vivas is going to be strong. It's an incredibly strong. Matter of fact, if you ever get a hold of Vivas GSP, the gel spun thread, keep a spool of, of that in your truck. Because if you ever need a tow rope, <laughs> this, this stuff is strong. But I, I like small diameter because it creates no bulk, but I want a strong thread at the same time. Yes, sir. When, when you use that upward pull on a pinch wrap, when you're tying the tail, it automatically centers the tail in the center, oh. top center of your... Peter, bottom. you're exactly right. It, it does that exactly. And uh, uh, pinch wrap... Uh, well, I could get off on thread control so quick. <laughs> That's a five-hour class. Yeah. If I wanted, sometimes when you put a piece, an element, a piece of material that you're going to secure, you would like to have a loop. When you lift this up and you go over the top, there's a point where there's the tension comes off the thread. And you would like to have that loop going to the left to catch your material as you're going over the top. Every time I take a wrap, my thread is making a half twist clockwise, looking down, clockwise looking down from the top. So when I start doing a bunch of wraps, if I just keep going, every wrap creates a, a twist. And pretty soon, what might be pretty flat thread becomes cord, becomes tight. So if I wanted to take that flat, if I wanted to get back to a flat thread, or if I wanted to get to a point where that, that loop up here was going the direction I wanted. If I take my, this is a bobbin holder. This is a bobbin. Bobbin holder, bobbin. You can go in any fly shop, any fly shop magazine, any, any website. They're going to call this whole thing the bobbin. I've <laughs> been doing this too long. So. But if I take my bobbin holder, whichever direction I spin my bobbin holder, point my finger, I let it spin that way, going that way. If I stop it and come up here to tie in a piece of material, I'm going to get a loop that's going the direction that I pointed my finger. And that can be very helpful as you're tying your material. And I'm getting way behind. Uh, okay. First thing we're going to do back here is uh, I'd like to have uh, uh, on the back end of uh, flies, uh, especially steelhead flies, I like to have a little egg sac in there. And uh, typically I'm going to use uh, a red or a pink egg sac on flies like this. 
I think for the sake of seeing it better, I'm going to use red. And some of, Scott, some of you guys have come out on Wednesday nights. And you, you've heard ad nauseum me drone on about dubbing. If we take our dubbing pack and have the dubbing sticking out with just the edges, you can see the edges of the dubbing right there, just the tops of it sticking out. Without a doubt, 95% of the, big, the biggest mistake most tires make is they just reach in here and pull out some dubbing. Then they try to work with that to dub it onto the, the thread. If they're doing a noodle, just in other words, tying dubbing onto the thread itself, or if they're doing a loop, they take too much. They take too much. Next worst proportion error is something like an L-care caddis where you have to cut a hunk of material and, and Oh, so that's, that's the right amount of, of hair for my elk hair caddis. When you cut hair like an elk hair caddis and you look at how much you cut off, take at least a third out of there and you'll be pretty close to being right. Most people will take too much material, especially on dubbing. Now, my dubbing technique, very simple. Uh, I'm going to take these two fingers, finger and thumb, and I'm just going to pull off the tops. It looks like I'm getting nothing. But I'm just going on the top of what's sticking out of the pack. I'm not pulling any clumps out of there at all. Look how much I got. So I'm going to put this on my, on my bench. And we have these two fingers for a specific purpose. And it, it's to compress your dubbing and then to pack it down. So I put it on my table, on my bench. I compress it and I pack it down. Press it, pack it down. Now come back here and once again, just the tips. I, I just wisping. I, sometimes instead of dubbing, I call this wisping. Oops, see, that clump came out of there. I don't want that. So look how much I got. I'll put that right there with the rest of it. And I can see already I've got a section here where I need to put a little more, tighten that up. So I'm going to just once again come off the top. Put that right in that section, compress them, tamp them down, compress them, tamp them down. Okay, I think I'll do one more. Wisping, just pulling off the tops. Look how much I got. Lay it on there, compress it, tamp it down. Now, I'm going to build a dubbing noodle. And this is the only time that I use wax like this, this sticky, gooey, nasty. Now I use cobbler's wax a lot for my thread as I'm tying a steelhead for a salmon fly. But this is the only time that I'll use sticky wax. If you're looking for a dubbing, a bobbin, a dubbing spinner, hey Adam, if you're looking for a dubbing spinner, go out and buy a dubbing spinner. O-P-S-T, Olympic Peninsula Skagit Tactics, O-P-S-T. It's a single-headed loop. Many dubbin spinners have two posts right here and two loops. It's pretty heavy. It's got one loop right here. When I hook this into my dubbing loop and spin it, this spins absolutely true. It stays just like this. It doesn't wobble at all. Now, I get kind of particular about a dubbing loop and what, I'm, what I am doing in technique to ruin my dubbing loop. So, for example, what I'll do here is after I make my noodle, after I make my compression and tamp down, I'll come up here and take a length of thread, run it around my hand, come back up, Go right where I'm already tied in. I'll make a couple wraps. I go around this loop twice. Get it out of the way. Now this will be my dubbing loop right here. This is the only time I use this kind of stuff on the inside edge of both of them. Now if you do that and then you look at your, your loop, if you've got little wax nubbins on there, don't take them off with the hand you're going to use to pick up your dubbing. <laughs> it's 
probably a big mistake. So I'm going to take my single hook dubbing spinner, rest it in there like this, and keep a finger in there so I can control the, the width. But now watch this. I can pick up this whole noodle at one time and lay it in the loop all at one time. And we'll lay it in there, and what I'm looking for now is I want this dubbing to be on the bottom thread so that when I look down from the top thread, there's equal amounts on each side. So I want it in the dubbing loop to be spread equally. And then when I think I've got just about right, I'll close it up. Now that wax is going to hold that right there. Next thing is, at this point you'll see a lot of folks when they get a dubbing loop, they must be NASCAR fans or something because they want to crank this thing and think it's going to have a turbo sound to it or something if they spin it hard enough. Slow. Very slow. Painfully slow. And the reason I go slow is I want that loop to begin to grab and I'll just let it spin until it stops and starts to go back on its own. Hold it up and let it spin on its own. But if I crank this spinner really hard or really fast, so this thing is spinning as fast as it can, it will in fact close up my loop, but it also compresses your loop. So whatever materials you have in there are going to be bunched up together. They have no choice. You're going to bunch them up because the loop you have is compressing. So when I started, I had a loop like this. I spent it real hard. Now my loop is that big. And all that material in there has been, been piled up. No good. But if I go slow, I can get my loop formed and keep that width of my loop. So once again, I'm going to go slow. You know how you can tell when you have spun this too tight? It breaks. <laughs> With this dubbing loop, now I'm just going to wrap it just like I would a feather, and I'm going to put it right here. I'm going to have about three wraps side by side going from the tying point to the head and then back over itself. Did that um, piece of uh, tubing have a little barb sticking up or something? Because it looked like there was a... No, it was just a bad tube with Jan. Oh. No, it'll, it'll have no difference on the fly itself, but most of the time those little nubs are not sticking up there. Okay. Okay, now once I've secured that, Okay. Now the whole point of this egg sac back here is when this fly is finished, I, I want to look in there, I want to be able to look in the back end of this and see a little bit of an egg sac because all this material is really going to cover up most of it, but if, if it's going to look like a natural I'm just going to see a little bit of that egg sac back there. Okay. Now, any time of the year, black and purple are very effective. Uh, so any pattern of fly you tie, if it's black and purple, in the Pacific Northwest, it's going to do well. Uh, most tube flies are typically black and purple. Um, I, I can tell you this too, that if you went to Pacific Northwest for winter steelhead, 90%, maybe 95% of the flies you see will be on a tube, but 95% will be black and purple. It's an effective color for that time of year. Now the first, I'm going to put some, a hackle back here, and I'm going to just pick one out. Uh, this is actually called blue eared pheasant, and I like it because the barbs are long, but yet they're still wispy. They move really, really good. 
There was, oh gosh. <laughs> Two elements. There was a study completed recently that, uh, uh, about predators, and what they discovered was the predators, uh, why does a predator attack? What, what constitutes, what, what motivates them to attack? Any species, any predator, is going to be attracted to prey on size, shape, and color. Now, what does that sound like? Isn't that what fly tires do? We want to tie something that looks like size, shape, and color. Well, but then this study reported a, sec a fourth element that was most important and is what actually triggers the predator to attack. The first three just get their interest, but the last one is what causes them to attack. And that one they called animation. There's two kinds of animation. If I threw this into the river and, just, and somehow it could just hold in place, the current flowing over this element, this material, is going to cause this material to move. That's called small animation. The predator sees size, shape, and color. Oh, I like that. Then they see small animation. And I really like that. But then large animation, the retreat twitch on the rod tip, the things that cause this to jump. Let the current do its job, but then do things to make this more active. The large animation, that's when, that's when the predator really attacks. Now, I like to prepare barbs on feathers before they go to the shank, and I do it here instead of up at the shank because if I break this barb, I just get another one. I haven't tied it in yet. So this, this red dubbing we put in there is a couple purposes. One is to replicate an egg sac, but another thing it'll do is back here at the back end of this fly, we're actually going to tie in several pieces of hackle. And what I'm attempting to, to get here is I want that hackle to have, have if, I, if I tie it in too tight, the, t the hackle compresses. I want to tie it in so the hackle has to compress over this piece of dubbing that I put in. So instead of compressing like this, it stays flared out just a little. So I can come up here like this, 12 o'clock, pinch everything back, and all I'm looking at when I do that is the stem. I want that, I can see that stem going right in, next to the previous wrap, come up, secure it. I don't put a lot of confidence in tying or securing material with the wrap in the front. What does that do? It doesn't, it hadn't caught anything. It doesn't secure anything. Never understood that. Then when I've got this kind of stuff left over, push it back, that's going to be part of the program. Come back here and wrap over that. Now I've got wing, I've got material in the shape exactly that I'm looking for. And when this is in the water and the current's hitting it, it's going to move. It's going to be small animation. So then I'm going to take a piece of uh, pur uh, purple uh, blue-eared pheasant for the same reason. Long, it, it, they're not really long fibers, but they're stiff enough. And uh, I'll do the same thing here. What I'm doing here is I'm finding the, the tip, pulling everything down. And I keep a hackle plier here on the stem. I put the feather inside that hackle plier. Make sure the barbs are coming out to the sides the way I want them, 90 degrees. Inside edge of my scissors, and I'll go down 45 degrees on each side of the rachis or the stem. So now when I take this out of this hackle flyer, those barbs are already pointing the direction I want them to go. And the main thing this does is as you are palmering or wrapping a hackle, you avoid the problem of encumbering a wrap on previous wraps. A lot of times you'll, you'll turn a feather like this and you'll look at it and it's kind of bunched up that as you turned it, you picked, you ran over some of the barbs from the previous wrap and it looks junky. So by doing this, it gets the barbs out of the way. And I'll do, there's two little things I'll do. One is prepare those barbs that way. I'll tie this in right there. 
on securing wraps, uh, if I tied in this material with four wraps and they all were in the same place, in other words, four wraps right on top of each other, how many wraps are holding that material? One. One. The second, the third, and the fourth are doing nothing except creating bulk. Wraps are edge to edge. When they're not edge to edge, they're spiral. When are they spiral? If I want to tie in material and then get my thread out of the way, I can spiral up, get my thread out of the way. There are several times when I'll spiral wrap. Otherwise, they're always edge to edge. The only time a wrap goes on top of a previous wrap is in spinning deer hair. Wrap, second wrap right over that one, secure it. They both are turning. They both are wrapping the material. Otherwise, edge to edge. Nah. How do you break those barbs that they get into? Well, there's that, Peter, there's two ways. I'll, I'll show you both ways. So, you know, when I get this right here, you can, I don't know if you can see it, but as I started to bring this up, that one right there, I may have been kind of anal about this, but that when I came up, it started to catch on the red one. If I have a small bodkin and I just pick it out, that doesn't happen. Now I can come around, pull them back, tie off this material. edge to edge, going toward the head. Peter, there's actually two ways to prepare barbs before you go to the, to the hook shank. One way is to, any, and this works on any kind of a rachis or any kind of a stemmed feather. Uh, doesn't matter. If it has a stem, you can do this. You hold the tip in your right hand, and with the left hand, you grab it so your, this finger and this thumb can be on top. And as I do this, I'm going to press down with both finger and thumb at the same time. Now I've got them pinched, but here's what really bends them. I'll take this tip. Instead of just, I'm going to pull back and up. Back and up. And by doing that, that bends the feather. The other way is find your tip running on a feather on this one. Uh, okay, we'll just use this much of a tip. I've just got a little bit of tip sticking up here. Where is it? Right there. I keep a hackle plier right here on my stem. I'm going to put that little tip inside the hackle plier face up so that feather is facing me. The bottom side of the feather is on the bottom. Most of the time, if I'm really doing a, a fly I care about, it, maybe a display fly, before I put it here, I put it on the bench, and I'll take a, a brush, and I'll brush the bars <coughs> out just to make sure that they're all going out the right way. Then from, from this position, I'll take scissors, and what part of that blade is sharp? The inside edge. So by holding this feather here, I got, I'm not pulling hard, but i got enough tension to lift it up. I'm going to take the inside edge, and I'm going to, with, with this, with the barbs right now are, are flat. Take the inside edge, and I go at about a 45 degree angle with the tip, and I just very gently, you know how you can tell if you're pressing too hard? They come off. So I'm not being a smart aleck. I mean, get some feathers and practice this and get a feel. I guess it's kind of like a, a, a barber that, sh that gives shaves. I mean, you learn how hard or light to, to do that. Well, you'll develop a feel for how hard can I press on this. Are you actually feeling the barbs? Or are you bumping the scissors? It's a great it? question, Barry. Every time this inside edge goes across a barb, I feel it. I feel I could actually count them if I wanted to. Important to stay up here at the tip. And once I did this side, then I come over on this side, I just do the same. Don't be in any hurry. 
just go slowly, take a few at a time, and after I've gone all the way down, I can go back and do that two or three more times and get as much bend as I want in the feather. Then after I've done that, you can take it out of the vise, take it to the hook, tie it on, and those barbs are already going backward. Now, when you do that, do you still have to do this 12 o'clock thing? You can. You really sure you can if you want to. Uh, you don't have to, and most of the time you don't, you don't need to at all. Okay. Now, for good measure, we're going to do one more hackle. In the, this is called the butt shoulder, the back end of this fly. Another blue-eared pheasant. Find the tip. Stroke everything down. Here's where I would lay it down and take my toothbrush and feather it out. Cut right in the middle. Everything is level. Inside edge, scissors, just at the tip, 45 degrees, like a quarter inch at a time. And after I've gone all the way down, then I can stroke front to back all the whole way because they're already bent. Come on this side. You'll see a lot of guys will do this on just the left side. I'm not going to tell you a joke about them. So here's the tip. I lay the tip in at the tying point. Edge to edge wraps. I want securing wraps so that that tip is not going to come out of there. Take the stem. This is my handle. Why else do you take all that stuff off the stem? Here's an interesting thing. Can you see this? This is, this is a good thing to look at. Look at this stem, and sometimes you hear the discussion, do I tie that feather in at the tip or by the butt? Not an exaggeration. 99% of the time, I tie a feather in at the tip. How thick is this stem or rachis? How thick is the rachis up here? How flexible is this rachis up here? How flexible is it back here? Especially if I'm up around a collar and I'm tying in a feather and I'm going to end up with a stem sticking up. How many times you've tied a fly and you cut it off and you've got a big old tree trunk sticking out of there? No good. So I'm going to take this one now and do the same thing. Come around here. I'm looking at just the, pre where I, the previous wrap. I'm going to go right next to the previous wrap. And I'm going to come up here. I'm going to pinch the previous wrap. That's not a good thing. When you pull down like that on 12 watt and the thread breaks, the reason why guys that use 12 watt have a big hackle plier, it's going to hold my material for me while I do this. Now, I know I'm changing color, and I don't intend to change color, but I want to change color because I don't have another white one. Thank you. These are Mattarelli bobbin holders. And I'm going to do another jam hitch in front of that mess. I'm going to get a secure jam hitch in front of the mess going toward the vise with regular hitch wraps. And this is exactly what you would do if you wanted to change color of thread while you're tying, instead of doing a, a whip finish, cutting thread off and then putting a jam hitch and tying in new thread, move the thread you want to take off as far forward as it needs to go. Take the next color, do a jam hitch right where you stopped, and continue the jam hitch going toward the vise. Every one of those wraps will secure the tag end of the previous color. Then you get to back to the material, cut off the, pre the tag end of the previous color, you got no bulk, but you've changed colors. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to come up here.
secure, secure this. the edge. Alright. I always like to cut through the material when I can on the opposite side wherever the thread is hanging. That old guy's not going to play, so he, he goes. And I just did that. Okay. Alright. There's a fly you'll see in the presentation I called an Umqua Special. One of the cool things about that one is the tail and the, and the hackle. The, the, it's, it's red and white, and when you tie them in, you actually blend them together. It's really a cool looking fly. And that's kind of what you're looking for here, is you want the three different colors kind of blended together. And that, that looks like volume, but it's very, very, very thin. Very thin. Now this is the back shoulder. So now we're going to, thanks Barry, now we're going to get, we have a choice in, the, in this body right here, there's any number of choices you can you have. You can put flat silver, you can put a polar chenille, is everybody familiar with polar chenille? It's really a cool material, it wraps good and it's got little things that stick out to have a good movement. And then you've got stuff like this, it's, it's, it's a crystal braid. Um, how about if we just use silver, okay? I'll tell you what, we're going to use two things. This fly uh, was created by a guy named Ed Ward, which you'll see a picture of him in the presentation. Ed created this fly back in the 1980s. He actually used this fly and perfected it and really didn't tell people about it or admit to it until about the 1993 and then it became the rage. Everybody had to fish the intruder and now what you'll see today is uh, you, you'll look at steelhead and salmon flies and you'll see a fly described as intruder-like. <laughs> it's kind of like Avis wanting to be Hertz, I guess. I mean, it's, it's kind of intruder-like. So there's a ton of flies out there today on the market that are not intruder flies, but they are like intruder flies in that they have a rear shoulder, a thin body, and then a front shoulder. So we're going to get a spiral wrap, get our thread. I'm going to stop my thread up here about where I've got to leave some space to do about the same thing I did back here but with longer material. So we're going to wrap this quickly over here. This is intended to be a very thin body. Very sparse. And here again you can make the length of this to be different lengths depending on how much, how big of a fly you want to create. A lot of times on stuff like this, I'll go around it twice and then it comes straight up. And then I secure it. And again, I don't understand why we go in front of material thinking that's going to secure it. All right, now we're done with that one. So we'll get out of the way. Now this is that polar chenille I mentioned, and this is really good stuff. We kind of created a fly that we call the Brim Reaper, and uh, you, 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 you use polar chenille a lot on steelhead flies, mainly because if you look at it here, you've got a you've got a thread or a cotton kind of stem on one side, and all this material comes out the other side. If you've ever worked with burnt spay hackle, that kind of thing, exactly the same. But boy, all this stuff right here has great movement. It's UV, and so in here I've got this silver going on. Uh, by the way, one thing a lot of guys are doing right now is when they put silver flat braid right there, and they're putting the UV, and then uh, zap it, and uh, we'll put this on like ribbing, Rex, all right? Uh, 
look at the look this gives me right here. Now I'm going to put the front shoulder on this fly. It's going to look a lot like this back here in the, in the butt shoulder, but the feathers that I'm going to use up here are much longer. Look at all the stuff in the middle. Well, I tell you what, you throw this in, in, a, in a... Right now, I think the, the Brazos, typically where we fish, is it's under 100 CFS. It's probably closer to 50 CFS right about now. Where we fish these flies in the Pacific Northwest, uh, a good day, a Chamber of Commerce day out there is going to be about 4,500 CFS. That current's popping. And so you get a fly like this in there, and there's going to be movement all over the place. Now, first thing I would do normally right here is tie on another bulb. So the hackle we tie on will expand out. We'll skip that step for time's sake. I'm going to use uh, blue-eared pheasant again, but this time I'm going to use blue-eared pheasant. It's in the jumbo size. And it simply means it's, it's coming off the same bird the same way, uh, except it's just longer barbs. And what I'm looking for here is material I tie in here that flows all the way back to here. Think octopus, or I mean, th think, think squid. Think all those tentacles on that squid and how long <coughs> and flowing all of those tentacles were. Okay, now we, we can do exactly the same thing here with this stuff we did before. We'll find our middle, strip it down, put it in the plier, hackle plier. Inside edge, 45 degrees. And I can go over this front to back however many times I want to to get the amount of bend that I'm looking for. I did an apprenticeship with a guy named Michael Redensich, and his whole thing about fly profile was streamlined. There are a lot of flies out there that have a lot of height to them, and uh, that made him nuts. And so uh, I got used to tying flies that had a more streamlined kind of an approach to them, a profile, edge to edge, going toward the head. Now here's exactly what I was talking about before. Now all of a sudden, I got a lot of nice barbs left on there, but I've also got a huge stem coming up. And I don't want to mess with that. So I'm going to tie that off right there, edge to edge, going toward the head. On the one hand, it's kind of disappointing to think that all those good barbs, I could really get them flowing back every way I like, but I'm going to be left with a huge stem up here. But I don't want to mess with that. So you'll notice I kept the tip on there. The tip is in there, and that's by design. The tip is part of the flowing nature of this thing going backwards. Put it on top of Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, can you see how these barbs in the front? Look how they're as long as the barbs in the back. <laughs> Imagine this fly in the water and uh, the movement these barbs will have in the water. Now, the original intruder on a tube, uh, Ed Ward used um, actually hackle. And uh, Spay hackle. Uh, spay hackle would work. Uh, any kind of a dry fly hackle, really. But you, you'd want it thin. Uh, you, you know, you'd want it like in this 14, 16 size range. And he would tie it in up here in the front, and they'd be very long. And he actually tied them into a dubbing loop, spun it, pooched them back, and put it on that way. 
and he'd have all these long tentacles going back, and they were they were hackled. Another thing that's evolved since the original in '95 is now we use some stuff called Rhea. I'll pass that around if you want. Look how long this Rhea is wonderful material, uh, and this is ostrich. Ostrich is a whole lot like Rhea in that when you tie it in, you've got very long, very long barbs uh, sticking out. And when you tie that in up front, they come back further than the back side. Really, really a nice look. Okay, now here I think you can see what I was talking about. Look how, look at the diameter of the stem up here. Look at the diameter of the stem down here. I don't want to get down into here. So one thing you can do to kind of help yourself is, you know how you peel the fluff off? Peel it to where you don't want to go any further because there's no more material. Now look how big that stem is down here. So I want to avoid that at all costs. So I'm going to come up here and find the tip, peel it down. Now I've got that much sticking up. This much is going to go right into my hackle plier on my, my vise. Flatten these out. Inside edge, quarter inch strokes to start. Bend them down 45 degrees. Go back and make a couple long strokes. Uh, you could, like I said, Peter, you can do this by folding with your fingers, and uh, it's effective. I just think it takes too much time. And you've always got the risk that when you pull that up, you're going to break them off. That's, that's frightening. Okay, so I'm going to tie this in right here. Now, I'm, for, since this is the last element, I'm going to go toward the bend. I'm creating a thread base now to smooth all that junk out from the previous wraps. I'm going to get back to the tie-in spot and go back to front. I'm going to use that tip. I'm not going to cut it off. I'm going to come up here now and roll over. Pull it back. Put it back. Nothing's encumbered. Now we're getting back down here to that nasty part. That's a bigger stem than I want to mess with, so I'm going to come up here and tie it off right in there. Right in there. I'm going to take the tip in, pull that back already. Dutch, is that blue root pheasant, is it chemically stripped at all to get it that thin and wispy, or is no. that just the way it is? It's naturally? genetics. It's how this, this bird is bred. The feathers off of a blue-eared pheasant. Uh, if, you, if you go out to buy them, you can get them in medium, large, and jumbo. And obviously, it depends on the amount of length you want coming off of it. But now, look at the length of those front, that front shoulder. And can you look? Can you see in there that that red polar chenille? Imagine how that looks when you throw it out there in the water. You got a little bit of sunlight reflecting off of that booger. That's really cool. All right, now the head, the finish is important here. There's a couple steps uh, that um, the finish is precise, as if the rest of it hasn't been. Okay, uh, I'm going to take a comb, and these come in different sizes, and I'm going to take. Stick them right up here where I tie it off. But I don't want to go, I don't want to turn my vise any further that direction because that's the direction my thread will unwind. Well, that's starting to dry just a slight bit. 
when I cut at the, at the head, I never do this. Uh, what if you had hackle? What if you had legs? Yeah. That inside edge is, is there for a purpose. It can cut your thread. You don't need to do that. And you can avoid the, the damage or the risk of cutting a, a hackle or legs or something off. If you do that one time, you'll be looking for an alternative. Push that cone on there. plastic cone? They're plastic, uh, kind of a rubbery plastic. Uh, they come in a lot of different sizes. You can get them in different colors. Uh, this particular company, uh, they also have one that's clear. I don't know if you can see that, but it's, it's a clear cone. They also have one that's kind of cool that is uh, the cone itself has holes in it. And uh, I don't know if you can see this now. Oh, yeah. See the holes that are in there? And I've got steelhead friends that swear by this style, and they claim that it makes You know how, remember how Dale used to tie all those flies with rattles and, and saltwater flies? And, that's the same kind of thing. It creates a noise. It, it, it does that as work well, Peter, but it's, it, that works. Anything like that that's going to piss them off. That's kind of what you're looking for. Now, that, all that's holding that on there is some glue, right? So that's not going to, if this big old steelhead hits this thing, that's not going to hold up very well. So maybe there's something else I ought to be doing to this to secure that head, secure that cone on there. Double edge razor blade. Now to get this off, I'm going to put my fingers back here where the tube begins, back here. And with this hand, kind of push forward, and the whole thing comes off. All right, now that glue is on there. I'm going to take this razor blade, and I'm going to go up about an eighth of an inch in front of the tube, in front of the cone. So when I cut this off, I'm going to leave about an eighth of an inch on there. See, just a little bit, a little nubbin is left on there. Now, before you do the next part of this, you want to have a couple bodkins handy. One, a very small kind of bodkin and the other, a bigger kind of buck. Okay? So we cut that off. Now we're going to take, uh, when we make a flame on this lighter, you can see this. You see the bottom of that flame, it's blue? That's the hottest place. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hold this fly by the bottom of the tube, straight up. I'm going to strike a, a flame. I'm going to hold it over that quarter, that, that tube sticking out, the, the remainder. And I'm not going to allow the blue to catch it on fire, or to, to, to touch it, but I can get close enough that the heat off that blue is going to cause that plastic to melt. If I hold it just right, guess what happens to that melting plastic? What does it do? It rolls down. Where does it go? Right on the edge of the cone. That's better than any kind of epoxy I can put on there. So, and you, you want to be careful with this. You don't catch your fly on fire. I say that because I've done it. So there's, there's the blue part. And I'm just going to get close. Start to melt, and then you're out of fluid. So very quickly, you take your short bodkin, press it in the hole, and press straight in, straight in. Now, I'm very careful not to press in and turn until that little bubble right there, that little edge, is dry. 
if that's still wet and I push straight in and turn, you know what happens. That little edge comes off. Then you got a worthless fly. There's not enough room. So then after I make sure that, that, that hole now is big enough, I can put my monofilament in there. Now I'm going to take the little big one and I'm going to go straight in. I'm not going to turn it. I'm just going straight in. Pulling straight out. Well, until I ran out of fluid, it was doing okay. <laughs> All right. Now, the last thing I'll do is I don't need this much space in the back. Remember, this is the compression tube. I'm going to tie my leader through here, and I'll be glad to do that if anybody wants to stay and watch that. I'll run a leader through there. I'll tie on a, a hook. Then I'm going to pull that leader back forward, and the knot I'm connecting here, the, the knot goes into the compression tube. If I have it way back here, that would be kind of stupid. So I'm going to come up here now with that same razor blade, and I'm going to take all my material... There's that nice looking little egg sack. I'm going to pull it all down here. And I'm going to go in here about that long. And that's all I need. Now to run my leader through the front, come out the back, tie on that little hook, and it would look like this. See this knot that formed the loop? If I just pull my leader forward, that knot, that knot of the loop goes in the compression tube. Don't have to go far. What knot is that specifically? That's just a perfection loop. Is it? Just plain old perfection. Uh, in the winter steel head, I'll typically do a double surgeons. I just want a little more bulk back there. But most of the time, just a regular perfection loop works just fine. Yeah, you're using the knot and not the eye of the hook to hold it to. Great question, Rex. Uh, as all of this was evolving, uh, early on, we would only buy, these are called octopus or stringer hooks, and we would only use them if they were flat or level eye, so that that eye would go straight in to the tube and it would rest this way. Well, then the next evolution was to do this loop thing in the back, and it really didn't matter about the eye. And so it, it seems to ride better if it has an up eye, like this one. But sometimes the question comes up, what if there's some of these intruder-like flies that actually have a hackle? You'll see some in the presentation tonight uh, called a lady intruder. It's got a beautiful hackle that comes over the top. So... When you fish that fly, wouldn't you intend for that hackle to be able to ride up on top? Yes. So what do you do? Well, do I want that hook? If this, let's suppose there's hackle up here. Do I want to fish this fly hook up or hook down? Up. Most of the time it's going to be up. And in a lot of these rivers I'll show you here in a little bit, uh, catch and release, single hook, barbless hook, non-weighted hook, non-weighted fly only. And in that culture out there, the game warden, you don't worry about the game warden. You worry about the other steel header down there. If he catches you, do it. I mean, it's, it's ugly. So if I suppose I wanted, right now that hook is, is oriented to be down. If I pulled straight forward, it would just go in there down, wouldn't it? Okay, what if I just turn it over and keep that hackle on top? I just insert the knot, the loop, in a way that keeps the hook riding in the same dimension as the feather on the top, if I have that kind of fly. All right? Any questions? With that type of tubing, you don't need to have the junction tubing. Great question, David. No, 
No, you don't. You don't use any junction. That was part of the reason for coming up with this system was to get it eliminate because what would happen is you'd be fishing along and the two different pieces of tubing would separate. Now you got a different situation to deal with. So they started putting it all in one tube. Now we just cut off the compression tube to be the length that we need it to be. That's all. All right. Okay, who, who invented, who invented the intruder fly? Okay. Now there's a sharp hook on there. Yeah. You mentioned it a while ago. Yeah. What's that? I didn't watch it. They, they David, remember? If you were listening, yeah. if you were listening, you <laughs> no. Look at this one as tires. Look at look at this particular one, and this is one of the cool things about an intruder. There's a there's a like most patterns. There's a basic formula. There's a basic profile, recipe, and so forth. But you can experiment with different materials that you have. This is kind of peculiar. This is golden pheasant tippet. Now think about a golden pheasant tippet. How many times have you looked at that and thought, well, that would make good hackle, or I'd like to collar that thing? Yeah. <clears throat> Never. Try it. It's awesome. Because as you do exactly the same thing, find the center, tied in by that tip, pooch down the rest of them, Palmer it on, those bar. Look how straight those things stick out. Yeah. They're already dead. They're already. It's working for you. And then the, look, the current. Oh man, this is an animation machine right here. You can get those really long. Yeah. So point being, purple and black is you can dress it's like a Hereford cow. You can dress that up and take it just about anywhere, <laughs> and it's going it's going to perform pretty well. Uh, especially black and purple like that, but now try a different material. It's the same pattern in that it's got the butt shoulder, it's got a thin body, and you can just use the flat braid or you can use a flat braid and polar chenille like we did. Some people actually run a hackle around that thin body. And then you just imitate again. You duplicate what you did back here, up here. So you have the front shoulder, you got the butt shoulder. And what's the, what's the difference between, the main difference between the front shoulder and the butt shoulder? The longer hackle, hackle in the front. Hackle. What? Longer hackle in the front. Oh, thanks, Dutch. That's good. The only difference is you can use exactly, both of that, those, both of these, blue-eared pheasant. The back was large and medium. The front was jumbo. So the only thing is when you're, when you're putting your, your, your plan together for how you're going to tie your front shoulder, just make sure whatever you're using, if it's rhea, ostrich, lurid pheasant, hackle, whatever it's going to be, just make sure it's longer. All right? And I, I know you tie a lot of tube flies for bass. <laughs> you know what? I do. Um, you have to try it to believe it because it doesn't Where sound do you like. Where's that tube? Where's that tube? Uh, is that like shrink tubing? No, or soft no, that's that's essentially what it what, what it used to be. Now there's a couple of different companies. The the main one that most people go to is called Pro Sport Fisher. If you just Google Pro Sport Fisher, it'll it'll take you to this site, and they have uh, all these different sizes of tubes. They've got. Uh, uh, cones, they've got weights. If you're going to sneak in somewhere with a weighted fly, and I don't know why you would, but you got weights you can put on them. Uh, but Pro Sport Fisher uh, is, is a great resource. It's a primary resource. There's also Humer, E U M E R, is a company that was created. All they do is sell tube fly stuff. If you're familiar with HMH, hey, your HMH Vice. HMH actually sells mandrels, tubes, 
and some basic materials. One reason for that is when the tube evolution was occurring, we started using these mandrels. The HMH configuration on the jaws is perfect because this portion right up here inserts into the jaws. Not, not this way, it goes inside the jaws. It's, it's, one, it's very, very stable for a tube fly vice. And so they thought, hey, we're selling a lot of our stuff to tube fly tires. Why don't we sell tubes? So they started selling tubes. There's a company in Canada called the Canadian Tube Fly Company. And I've tried my best to get them to send me some heron. Uh, and, you know, just tell me it's blue-eared pheasant, but they won't do it. <laughs> But uh, they've got, they've got, and you can buy tube flies tied and all that. Another good company. So there's, there's several good resources. Um, what was the name of the Canadian one? Canadian Tube Fly Company. Uh, there's also, and here again because of the culture out there in Bill's country in Oregon, um, the Caddis, Caddis Angler Fly Shop in Eugene, Oregon, uh, the uh, Fly Fishing Shop in Welch's, Oregon. Uh, you wouldn't believe how much tying material these fly shops have. It's it's scary. Yeah, Waters the, West too. Waters West. Uh, that's probably even better. One. At the very tip, you'll see a map here in a little bit of the tip of uh, the Olympic Peninsula, a little town called Port Angeles, and there's a fly shop there called Waters West, and uh, they may be uh, fly shops. They may be the best of all. Uh, and they're right at the tip of the Olympic Peninsula, so they get all those people going to the hoe and bogus yield <coughs> sold up. They get some serious steelheaders. Matter of fact, you'll see, I'll show you this later. There's a little town on the western slope of the OP. It's called Forks. Forks, Washington. 3,000 people live in Forks. Over 50 of them are steelhead guides. <laughs> <laughs> it's an important part of their culture. And the beauty of it is, if you go, and all you have to do is go stay in Forks. And you never say, I want to come and fish the hoe, or I want to come and fish the sole duck, or the quilly ute, or any of those. You just arrange to, for a guide. And when they pick you up, they'll say, Here's where we're going to fish today. And, and I won't get into it a lot later, but the, the reason for that is that these rivers on the OP are on the western slope of the Olympic mountain range, and they blow out pretty quick, pretty easily. Everybody, every steelheader sometime in their life has to fish the Ho, the H-O-H -H River. It's, it's right up there with the North Umpqua. Mm -hmm. And Ho gets blown out a lot. And so you can go there expecting to fish the Ho, but you're going to end up fishing something else if the Ho's blown. But that's okay because there's literally six or eight other rivers right there that are all world-class blue ribbon steelhead fisheries. So you're not, it's not quite like the hoe, but it's, you're, it's a good strong avis. If it's not hurts, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good deal. The other thing you have to be careful of, if you're ever going to fish AOP and you arrange for a guide, uh, call a, a day ahead of time just to confirm everything. But let's say, for example, you're going to fish the Quillyute River. It's one of those in that same area. You need a Washington, a state of Washington fishing license. You need a fishing license from the Quileute tribe. Don't don't laugh. It's serious business. Oh yeah. And if you have a guide, it has to be from the Quileute tribe. And, and there's there's no alternative. I mean, there's no plan B. That's the deal. So when you go up there, they pick you up wherever you're standing. There's only like two or three places to stay in Forks. When they pick you up, they tell you today we're going to Bogashiel. And you might say, well, there's any chance we'll get in on the home? Well, maybe later. We'll see how it's flowing. But they'll put you on a great river. But the other thing I was going to say is they not only get blown out, but there's an incredible political battle that goes on and has gone on for as long as I've known between the state of Washington and the federal government and the Native Americans. And a lot of it has to do with the treaties that were created many, many years ago, and most of those treaties have a lot to do with whether or not they're allowed to net fish. You'll see a picture later on at the estuary where the hoe goes to the Pacific Ocean 
and right at that estuary is the Ho Native Americans of the Ho tribe, and their treaty allows them to net steelhead and salmon. It's awesome to see what they pull out of there. It's all, it also piss you off, but they can they're covered by doing it. So what happens is there's all this political crap that goes on, and all of a sudden one day the chief of the Ho Nation says, Ho's closed today. They have, by treaty, the authority and the right to declare their fishery closed. And so you can spend all that money and you get out there and you, you can't wait to fish the Ho, especially if you fished it before. It's one of those rivers when you come out of it, you're thinking, how soon can I get back here? And so you go all the way up there, you spend all that money, and they show up to pick you up that morning so you can't get in the Ho. Tribe closed it. That happens. So you have to prepare. It's a whole different kind of perspective when you go up in that area to fish. But is that the tribe that, that projects platforms out over the river and they have big hand nets and they capture the salmon as they leave? No, there's there's that's a Columbia. Well, it, you know, they're up on the Deschutes now. Yeah, yeah. They, they by treaty they're allowed to do that. And you can drive along that river and you can see their platforms. And they have every right. I mean, when the fish are jumping, that's when they're out there and they're just catching fish as they're jumping upstream up the waterfalls. Dutch, if you're not going to uh, cover it in your program, where the elk will come down the middle of the park and goes by Fort Andrews. Uh -huh. uh, where was the dam that they took out? About 10 miles upstream. Up from 101? Or? Yeah, up from 101. And that's a great story, Jim, because... Uh, that was a battle for many years between the Elwha tribe and the state of Washington and the federal government. And the decision was finally made to take that dam out. And kind of like the dam on the Clark Fork outside of Missoula, Montana, the fear was that they were going to take that dam out and they had to estimate, the engineers had to estimate how much silt was built up behind that dam. So when the dam came down, they had to account for all that silt that would move, and that was a big part of the the, the natural uh, fishery in any estuary. is is an, a, 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 has a lot to do with the with the aquatic life as well as the plant life. It's a, it's biological perspective, and so they estimated how much silt would move when the Elwha Dam came, and it was like ten miles now, and it, about three times their estimate. And they thought we're going to be ruined forever. It's it's never going to it's never going to recover from this, because all this silt just moved right out in the estuary. Within three months, they had salmon in the Elwha. It's a it's an awesome thing to see. But the if you go by the Elwha now, you'd never know that they had the issues they had. But it's a phenomenal. It's a great fishery. But it pales. It, it's not. It's not. When you consider that whole Olympic Peninsula, it's a very good one. And you, you certainly wouldn't turn your nose up and start uh, fishing the Elwha. But when you got the bogus shield and the sole duck and the hoe just down the road, there's this, that, that was a problem living in Oregon. If I had a day to go fishing, dadgummit, where am I going to go? Because <laughs> there's too much good water close. I mean, incredible water, close. So you get spoiled pretty fast, for sure. Well, there from where you stay, they're, they get three, four hours up to the other end of the, up to the peninsula, wasn't it? Uh, from Portland area? Oh, well, from Portland, see, you can go two ways to get to Forks from Portland. You can go up through Tacoma and then across 101, or you can go on the coast, and the coast takes more time. The coast takes more time. Yeah, and... and Straight up I-5 is better. And that'd be, that'd be on, the, on the long side three hours to get from Portland to yes. Port Angeles. That's, that would be if you went up on the coast. I'll show okay. maps of that here in a little bit. So it's only about two hours. Though. Yeah, something like that. It, magnificent scenery. I mean, it's a, it's one of the things that takes a dad get much time to drive up there is how many times you're going to stop and get out and just look at it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just takes your breath away to see the scenery. Here. 